All right. How are you guys? Great. Well, I tell you, I'm glad you're here today. We, you have come for a very, very special day. I'd like to ask our, uh, are we starting? I'm sorry. I'll back up. Oh, go ahead. 
Go ahead. We're starting with me? All right. We got so much going on today, I can get out of order quick. We are so glad that you're here today. I want to ask our deacons to come up and uh, their wives and also our elders, if you'll go ahead and come up. We want to welcome you today to Oasis Community Church. We are so glad that you guys are here today. Uh, very, very special, always having guests with us. Oasis, let's show our appreciation to our guests. If you will look uh, at the screen and you're a guest, uh, there's a telephone number. And if you will text the word welcome to that telephone number, uh, it's going to send you a, a form to fill out very quickly. I think all it's going to ask for is your name, uh, your email address, and I believe it'll capture, if not, uh, give us your uh, cell number. Uh, what you're going to receive is an email once a week for about six weeks. It's going to tell you something about the ministries of the church. At the end of the six weeks, it's done. We're not going to spam you forever, right? Uh, we just want to share some exciting things that God is doing in our fellowship. And if you'll take the time to do that, that would mean an awful lot to us. Also, if you're a first-time guest today, uh, go by our guest services, uh, our welcome center right here behind the stage. And we have a gift for you, okay? We want you to pick that up today. Uh, just a small token of our appreciation for you being with us today. Now, also, at the end of our time together uh, today, as you're walking out of the building, we have some people, uh, some greeters, who are going to hand you a uh, postcard. And the postcard's telling you about four different church-wide activities that are going to be happening uh, this summer. Uh, for example, on June the 19th, we're going to have a baby dedication. And if you have a, a baby that you would like for us to dedicate, all you need to do is to uh, send that information uh, to me. Uh, if you need my telephone number, uh, there is a card at the Welcome Center as well. But uh, send me the parent's name, baby's name, and one picture. One picture. One picture, okay? Not that we don't think your baby's beautiful, but we need one picture, all right? That's going to be on June the 19th, so we need to get those very, very quickly. Uh, Oasis, we will celebrate our fourth birthday on July the 17th. All right, all right. Uh, we're going to do that uh, at Bringle Lake Park. Uh, we're going to have food and all of the trimmings, uh, and uh, it's going to be a very, very special day. We're going to try to meet out there about noon. Uh, so if you will, meet us out there at Bringle Lake Park. Our guests are more than welcome, okay? And we want you to come celebrate that with us. On August the 7th, we're going to have Bless the Backpack. School's going to be starting very, very soon, and we want to pray over our teachers, our parents, and our students. Uh, we're going to have a watermelon supper out at Bringle Lake. We're probably going to need it on August the 7th, all right? Uh, might even get a few baptisms after that, right? All right. Uh, then uh, every second Wednesday, which would be, uh, let's see, will it be this Wednesday? Is that right? Yeah, this Wednesday coming up. Every second Wednesday in the month from June, July, and August uh, at our adult Bible study called Refuel, we're going to have homemade ice cream, okay? And so remember that. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing what inspires people. All right. Although I'm committed to that. I'm committed to that as well. So at 715, uh, we're going to have some homemade ice cream and study the word of God together. We're in a series called Rooted. Hence the big tree. Yes. With these massive roots here. Uh, it is, again, entitled Rooted, and we're in a study of the book of Colossians. And so I hope you'll come out and be with us. Uh, so everybody remember to bring your favorite recipe of homemade ice cream, okay? And uh, we're looking forward to that. But a lot of great activities churchwide this summer. Make sure you're a part of many of those. If you cannot be at all of them, make sure you come as quickly uh, as, or as often as you can. Well, the reason these people are standing up here today is not because they're taking up the offering. Some of you may be scared that I've increased the number of ushers. But uh, actually, uh, if you'll raise your hand, if you're one of our uh, deacon candidates, just raise your hand a second. All right, these are the men that uh, the elders have prayed over and the church has approved for us to ordain as our, uh, uh, our deacons. Over the last several months, we have really established some uh, great patterns of leadership development here in our uh, church, and we're real excited about that. Have a real good core of men who are serving as elders, and now we've asked these men to come and to join us in the role of deacons. You know, deacons are very, very important to a New Testament church. Very important. And if you don't know much about them, I would encourage you to go to the book of Acts. 
uh, they're not just here to serve communion and they're not just here to oversee the physical things of the church. They're actually uh, to be engaged in ministry, right? They're to be full of wisdom, full of faith, full of the Holy Spirit. They should be bold in preaching the gospel of Christ. They should have the ability to be able to pray over people and for God to use them to work in miraculous ways. What they do is very, very important. It's not secondary to anything. And so we're very thankful for the men that are here and for their wives. I'd like to ask my wife to come now. I know we have some gifts uh, for uh, the men and also for uh, their, their wives. All right, there we go. All right. We have these uh, certificates as well as you're going to get a very special one today, Craig. All right. All right. Here, if you'll take that one. You're going to get a very special one today. I'll have to give yours a little differently next week. Okay. All right, sound good? Got it. All right, good deal. All right, we're going to give you these ordination certificates here. I'm going to come back through and do that. All right, all right, let's see here. All right, there we go. All right, good deal. All right. Got these in order. All right. Thank you. All right. Where's Mikey? There we go, Mikey. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. There you go. As opposed to how he comes often. <laughs> there we go. All right. Let me introduce uh, these folks to you. This is uh, Ronald and Samantha House. All right. By the way, Ronald just won a national award for his service in our community. So, got a trip to Washington, D.C. All right. This is Buddy and Jonna Williams. All right. Buddy works for the state. Do you do uh, roads? You don't want anybody to know that, do you? Okay. All right. I'm only here to help. All right. All right. These are the Harlands. All right. Craig and Jennifer Harlan. And uh, good folks. Uh, I'm going to throw you under the bus, too. When your power goes out, no. Okay. All right. <laughs> Give me a call. There you, go. you get plenty of calls, don't you? All right. All right. Donald. This is Donald Buster, your family. I think I saw him in the back. Yes, sir. All right. Good deal. And your love. see how you can I can't. I can't. I can't. People say, he's preaching at me. Who do I yeah. see? Yep. All right. I don't see how you can make out. I got it. Your beautiful wife. All right, all right. Vanessa's with us. I've known Vanessa for a long time. Yes, years ago, I'll tell you this quickly, years ago, uh, we lived in the same apartment complex, and uh, one day this guy on a motorcycle came up and took her out of her apartment, threw her on the motorcycle, and took off. And I told Shannon, we need to find out who that hippie is. <laughs> all right, all right, good deal. Okay, we got Mikey, or Mike, Mr. Mike today. Yes, sir. All right, and Stacy Adams. All right, great to have these guys. Uh, Mike oversees our security teams. I'm already very thankful for what he does. All right, this is Robert and Michelle Ward. All right, uh, serves as a, a chaplain in our community. And very thankful for you guys uh, as well. Guys, if you want to, you can come up beside some of the elders and all. And I just want you to lay hands on them. You might have to gather a, together a couple of folks. John, if you will, you can come right here. I think you had said something wanting to pray over Craig because he needs extra prayer. Okay. All right. <laughs> Okay. If you will, will you just join us as we pray uh, over these men and women and for the ministry that God's called them to? Father, we just want to thank you today that we have an opportunity to celebrate good men. And we live in a world today that needs good, godly Christian men. Not perfect men, because there's none but Jesus. But men who have a commitment to obey you, to be filled with the Spirit of God so that they might do exploits in your name. Father, I pray that you will bless their ministry here at Oasis and in the community. May they, years from now, be recognized as a catalyst for revival in our community. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. All right, let's show our appreciation to these guys. You may be seated. I'll ask the band to come up, and we'll begin our worship time. All right?
Good morning, Oasis. Why don't you guys stand with us? Let's sing about his amazing grace and his love and mercy. Amen. Got some familiar songs this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory. King above all kings Who shakes the whole earth With holy thunder And leaves us breathless In awe and wonder The King of glory The King above all kings This is amazing grace this is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You would lay down your life That I would be set free Whoa, Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me yes amen who brings our chaos back into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of all nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of its brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings yeah this is amazing grace this is a failing love that you would take my place I sing for all that you've done for me. Oh, oh, all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
sing this hymn with us. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus the Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner condemned something that has to be experienced and I pray that you will experience that afresh this week as we prepare to receive our offering today let's pray a prayer of thanksgiving father we thank you today for that incredible love a love that knows no end a love that knows no boundaries it is higher than deeper than wider than anything that we could ever imagine we thank you for that because we know in ourselves we're undeserving of such love we thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus to die for us and to secure for us the victory we could never have in our own strength. Thank you for the offerings that are being uh, received today. And those that are received here, I pray that you will give us wisdom to use them to announce this incredible love to the world. And it's in the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. You may be seated.
We uh, launch a brand new series of sermons today uh, that I'm very excited about. If you're taking notes, and I hope that you are, uh, write these down in your notes. The title of the series is Five Smooth Stones. Five Smooth Stones. And if you'll uh, notice on the screen, uh, there's a, a picture that's going to come up. It's probably one of the most famous uh, pieces of art in the history of the world. Does anybody know uh, this piece of art? Yes, Michelangelo's David. It is in the city of Florence, all right? How many of you have actually traveled to Florence and actually seen this in person? All right, I'm amazed at the number of people who have been to Italy. All right, that's great. That's a little further out than Sims, I believe. And uh, so uh, that's exciting. I've never actually seen this statue uh, in person. There is one uh, that is a, a replica, if you will, uh, of this uh, beautiful statue in the city of Davao which is in the southern Philippines, and it's absolutely a beautiful, beautiful replica of this uh, particular statue. Uh, David is probably one of the most beloved characters in all of the Bible. Believe it or not, David is mentioned uh, more times than any other biblical character by name than the Lord Jesus Christ. He is mentioned more than Abraham. He's mentioned more than Moses. Uh, in the Old Testament. He's mentioned more times than Peter or Paul in the New Testament. And probably uh, this is a biblical character that many of us learn very early uh, if you grew up in church like I did. Uh, this is one of the characters that I uh, was taught about very early. Perhaps Adam and Eve might have been the first one. The Lord Jesus Christ might have been uh, one of the first ones. But as far as biblical characters, David represents uh, probably one of the most rehearsed stories uh, in all of the Bible. Does anybody know where I'm going with this? What is the story that we are familiar with about the life of David? David and Goliath, right? David and Goliath. And we all remember that story uh, from, her, uh, from our childhood. We're actually going to review that story today, but I bet there are some things that you don't know about the story. There are things and details that maybe that you say, well, I've heard that all my life. You know, when I was in school uh, or in Sunday school, you know, I remember the flannel graph board and the cutouts and had it up there. I know all that you can tell me about David. Well, I think maybe there's some things I'll share with you today that perhaps that you don't know that's going to make the story even more meaningful uh, to your life. And not only that, I think there's a principle that we overlook that creates a problem for us in the daily living out of our faith. And I'll summarize that out at the end. What we're going to do is we're going to take the story of David and the five smooth stones, and then I'm going to take us for the rest of our series in this month through five smooth stones that are found in Psalm 103. We're going to talk about some of the blessings, if you will, that God provides for us through the Lord Jesus Christ and how we can take those stones in our own lives and that we can defend ourselves and not only defend ourselves when Satan attacks, but also how we can sustain victory uh, in our lives as believers. But the story of David and Goliath, quite, quite an interesting story. Uh, David. David is, is a profound character to me uh, in the Bible. He was really a man's man, I think in the truest uh, sense of the word. Uh, David uh, had both a uh, tender side, but he also had a warrior-like uh, personality uh, and mentality. Uh, he was very, very um, tender in the sense that he wrote poetry, right? He had an ability to put words together, uh, not in the sense of, you know, roses are red, violets are blue, but in Hebrew poetry, he had such a knack, if you will, a giftedness for being able to write poetry. Matter of fact, not only did he write poetry, but, but he wrote lyrics to songs, right? He was a musician. Does anybody know at least one instrument that David played? He played the harp. Now, when I say a man's man and talk about a harp, you generally don't put the two together. That's what makes David such an interesting character uh, in the Bible. He did have the ability to play the harp and to write poetry and to write lyrics. Matter of fact, in the uh, Old Testament book of Psalms, it's a collection of 150 Hebrew hymns, right? Hebrew hymns. And David is credited with writing at least 73 Number one hits out of the, the book of Psalms. And David, as I said, was very, very tender. Uh, he was a lover. 
He was a lover, probably the most famous story of his love life, unfortunately, is a sin that he committed, his adultery with Bathsheba. But did you know that he was also married to eight women, all right? Uh, now, God didn't sanction that. The Bible tells us that God created a man for a woman and for a lifetime. Uh, that's God's design, but it was uh, an Achilles heel, if you will, and David's life was his uh, propensity to love the ladies. And uh, he was married to eight women, one of those being Bathsheba. He had 18 children that we know of, so uh, that tells us a little bit about, uh, about his love life. Uh, but that's more of his tender side. On the other side, we know David as a warrior, right? He was a warrior, uh, obviously, in the story of David and Goliath, we have that story. Uh, but did you know that uh, there were 100 terrorists, they were called Philistines at the time, there were 100 terrorists that were terrorizing the nation of Israel uh, when he was a young man and when Saul, the first monarch of the United Kingdom of Israel in its early days, these terrorists were wreaking havoc upon the, the nation of Israel and David was commissioned to go out and to hunt these men down and to kill them. Not only did he kill them, but the Bible tells us it records for us that he actually circumcised them and brought the hundred foreskins to Saul and laid them at his feet. Uh, what I'm trying to communicate is this is a bad dude. This is a bad dude, okay? So he has that complexity of being tender but also being a warrior at the same time. Probably the greatest truth that I could tell you about David is that he is in many respects a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you do understand that Jesus is a descendant of David, right? You do know that there is a covenant between David and Jehovah that has in it a hope, not a wishful thinking, but a certain expectation, a promise that one day a descendant of David, the Lord Jesus Christ, will come back to this earth and not only will he reign and rule over the nation of Israel, a reunited kingdom of Israel, but one of these days he's going to reign over the entire globe. One of these days he will bring his kingdom to the earth. And so there's a lot of things we can learn about David and his relationship to the Lord in that beautiful uh, typology. Now, let's get back to the story of David and Goliath. This event occurred about 3,000 years ago. It's a little older than you, Doug, all right? Just a little, just a little, right? We're about the same age, right? Right? Uh, about 3,000 years ago, this particular event occurs. It, it occurs during the uh, reign of King Saul, as I mentioned earlier, the first monarch of the uh, United Kingdom uh, of Israel. And the Philistines come and invade the land of Palestine or the nation of Israel. Uh, I don't know what you know about the Philistines, but the Philistines actually originated on the island of Crete. It was out in the Mediterranean Sea, and uh, they decided that they would leave the island of Crete, and they wanted to expand their territory and its influence, and they go to the east side, uh, excuse me, the west side uh, of the land of Israel on the coastal area. And they arrive there, but their plans are not to stay there. They want to ultimately conquer the cities that are in the mountains. They want to conquer the cities of Bethlehem and Hebron, uh, the city of Jerusalem, the capital city of, uh, of Israel at the time. And, and what they wanted to do was to get into the mountain area and to secure the highlands so that they would be able to maintain their geographical military advantage during that particular time. And so they come in to the land of, uh, of Israel and their armies are marching and they're going to come upon one mountain range, but there are a series, if you're taking notes, write this down, it's very interesting to the story. There are a series of valleys that run between two mountain ranges in the land of Israel, all right? Sheflah is actually the name of this series of valleys. They run from the 
west to the east or the east to the west, and there are a series of them. Invading armies always would come from the sea into that area of the land of Israel, and it was easier for their armies to begin to march through the valley and be able to take cities and villages going up into the mountains toward the land of Israel. But at this particular time, Saul has gotten word. King Saul has gotten word that there is an invading army that is approaching, and see, he wants to stop it before it ever gets close to the city of Jerusalem. So he mounts an army, and they go up on a mountain range. And so now you have the Israeli army on a mountain range, and now you have the Philistine army that is on this mountain range, and between them is one of the multiple valleys that run between these mountain ranges. And they are at a place where neither one is able to move. There's no way to take military advantage in this situation. Nobody wants to go down into the valley and try to fight going up into the mountains. No way. The Philistines don't want to do it. Israel doesn't want to do it. And there is a stalemate that takes place for many, many days. And nobody knows what to do. Finally, the Philistines choose a champion. And his name is Goliath. This was a common practice during the day, particularly if you didn't want to shed a lot of blood in a massive battle. What you would do is an army would select its champion, and he would call to the other army to send their champion, and the two would do battle. Hand-to-hand combat was the normal way of doing things, and so if Goliath won then all of the Israeli soldiers would become the slaves to the Philistines. If the other hand, the champion of Israel were to come out and to win, then all the Philistines would become the slaves of the Israelis. And so you know the story. Goliath comes down. He stands there on the mountain range. And for 40 days, he challenges Saul. He challenges the armies of Israel Send me out a champion that will do battle. And he lays out the terms. Win or lose. Somebody is going to solve this. Me or them. You pick your champion. I'm the champion of the Philistines. We know the story of how Saul trembles in his tent. He doesn't really know what to do. He's uncertain. But in the providence of God, Jesse, the father of David, tells his son. By the way, David is the eighth of seven sons. That's very important to understand because in the Bible, the number eight is the number of new beginnings. New beginnings. He says, go check on your brothers and see how they're doing. Take them bread and take them cheese and take them milk. And check on their well-being. And you know the story of how David goes and he checks on his brothers. And while he's checking on his brothers, here's the time of day when the giant of the Philistines comes out. And now not only does he uh, try to intimidate the Israeli army, not only does he uh, try to uh, manipulate them as soldiers, but here's something else that he does. Now he blasphemes the God of Israel. David said, who is this guy? Somebody needs to do something about that. Somebody needs to stop his blasphemy. The oldest brother of David looks at him and says, you're just a shepherd boy. Go home and keep your few sheep. We're professionals. You go home. And David says, I'm not going anywhere. Somebody needs to stop him, and it might as well be me. Saul says, you can't do that. You're just a boy. You're a young man. This guy is a champion. He is tested. And not only that, but do you see how big he is? Do you see? Naturalize. Naturalize. Do you see how big he is? Do you hear the baritone in his voice? 
Do you realize, and the Bible gives us this information, do you realize that his helmet weighs 30 pounds? 30 pounds. Do you realize that he wears a coat of armor that is made of iron and that it weighs 150 pounds? Not to mention he has a spear. And the head on the spear weighs 30 pounds. Are you getting the image? How many of us could even stand up under the weight of what he wore? He wears what we would call today shin guards. That you and I would have a hard time picking up our feet to even walk. In other words, you need to understand that naturally, this is a bad man. This is a big man this is nothing to trifle with we're, we're talking about what a man who will take your life and not think twice about it and Saul says well boy if you're going to go take my armor and David says I'm not taking that armor I've not tested it I don't know that that works but I do know what works my God has used the tools that he's given me as a shepherd, and I've, what, I fought a bear and a lion. I'll go with those. Now, you do understand, if you're taking notes, that in the Israeli army, there were three types of soldiers. You do, you do know that, right? There was, first of all, what we would call the cavalry. These were the ones who had chariots and horses. Then there were footmen and infantry, right? This, these were the infantry. These were the ones who went to hand-to-hand -hand combat, okay? And then there was a small regiment of special forces that had slings. Now, I'm not talking about the sling you can buy at Walmart, if you can even buy those today. But you remember as a little boy, maybe, or maybe as a little girl, you got, what, one of those slingshots we're, we're not talking about that we're we're talking about a leather pouch that had two long ropes on it that these men were very very skillful in using and by the way the five smooth stones that were selected by david where he selected those studies have been done on those stones and those stones are more dense than any other stones in the land of israel and traveling at a certain speed they have the same impact as a bullet from a 45. Dense, powerful, in the hands of somebody that knows how to use it. And David had tested these. What you would do is you would take it and you would make circular motion with this, right? Right? And you're going about six to seven rotations a second. What you do is you let go of one of the ropes. And when you let go of one of the ropes, what? That rock goes out like a bullet. Yeah, but how accurate were they? Well, uh, the Bible tells us and also history tells us. Matter of fact, uh, there are tapestries of medieval uh, Europe where they had these slingers, if you will. And did you know that these slingers could take a bird out of air in flight? David brings what's tested. And he comes off of the mountain. And Goliath comes off of the mountain. Now let me tell you something that maybe you don't know. Things aren't always as they appear. The devil, in the eyes of God, looks much different than he does to us. You see, it's really not about a power struggle between us and the devil. It's about a truth struggle. You see, the devil's a deceiver. He doesn't, know, he doesn't want you to know the truth. He deceives. That's what he does. 
And so he tries to manipulate things and to intimidate you and cause you to look with natural eyes and to hear with natural ears whenever he's pressing upon you, when he's pressing upon your health and he's pressuring in your marriage and he's attacking your children and, and you're having trouble at work and, and you're having trouble at church and all the things in life are happening. He is what? He's breathing out blasphemies against God and he's trying to intimidate you with deception rather than the truth. And you've got to know the truth. So as David is making his way off of the ma mountain to meet this giant in the valley, have you ever noticed that the scriptures tell us that Goliath was led down the mountain to the valley? You ever notice that? There was an attendant that went before Goliath and led him down the mountain to the valley. That's a clue. That's a clue. As he gets closer to the valley floor and he sees this kid walk up still several hundred yards away, but, but is walking up and as Goliath looks at him, he says, Do you mean to send this boy to fight me, the champion, with sticks like I'm a dog? Let's look at something real quick. Look at 1 Samuel 17, verse 40. David picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into his shepherd's bag, then armed only, with, armed only with his shepherd's staff and a sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff, singular, staff, singular, staff. What, what, did, what did Goliath say? You come to fight me with sticks. There's a clue. He's being led down the mountain. He says sticks when there's one. What's happening here? Studies have been done on these passages and doctors and scientists and researchers have looked at it and found some amazing things here. They've, they've discovered that even today when there are people who have enormous size that are outliers, if you will, of the normal. Matter of fact, one of the tallest men who has ever lived was 26 years old when he died, and at 26 years old, he was 8 feet 11 inches tall. Many of the people who have this magnificent growth patterns in their life, they've discovered have a tumor on their pituitary gland and causes acceleration of growth hormones and all. But there's also something else that's interesting. They've also discovered that for these people who have this, many of them have very poor eyesight. They, they either see double or they're very nearsighted or both. I suggest to you that that's the case with Goliath. That's why he's being led down the mountain. He can't see. That's why he says, you come to me with sticks. There's one. Now, the reason I go into these details is primarily for this. Goliath wasn't everything he seemed to be. And your enemy is not everything he seems to be. You, you think he's everything that he says he is. You think that everything he throws your way is everything that it is. And how many of you and I in our lifetimes cooperate with his lies and his deception and we begin to worry and to fret and what do we do? We make the situation even bigger than it is. And we begin to think negatively about things and we begin to operate in fear. And we're paralyzed in our fear. I would suggest to you that the Spirit of God communicated with David and revealed to him the weakness of this giant. Because naturally, you wouldn't know that. But if you're in tune to the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God is going to tell you what you need to know. I believe the Spirit of God told David, you got this. He can't see. I think he also told him something else. Play into what you have tested 
Goliath expected a hand-to-hand combat. But David's weapons were tested not to get close. But from a distance, use what God had taught him to use. We know the story, don't we? David gets that thing going. Six to seven rotations a second and lets that one rope go. And that rock goes exactly where he intended it to go, right between his eyes. Did it kill him? I don't know. Did it knock him out? I don't know. But I know David knew what to do. He ran up on him and took the giant sword and what? Cut his head off. Now, I'm going to tell you, those are some interesting details. But I'm going to tell you something that the Lord, I believe, revealed to me, and I'm not the first, I'm sure, to notice this, and perhaps you've already noticed this. But there was something just a couple of years ago in rereading that story that the Lord revealed to me that changed the whole dynamic of that story. What I was taught as a little boy was to have the faith of David. What I was told as a little boy was to trust God in those circumstances and to run out and in your faith go out and defeat the enemy. You probably read books here recently by famous pastors in our uh, community, or not community, but our nation, who tell you to what? To face your giants and to face them down and for you to run out there in faith in God and to defeat your giants. You ever read books like that? You ever heard sermons like that? Sure you have. That's not the point of the story. Matter of fact, if you do that, you're going to get in trouble. You will be hamburger helper if you do that. You say, how do you know that? Because I've done it. That's not the point of the story. Let me, let me illustrate who you and I are. You and I are on the Israeli mountain, intimidated, unable to be successful against this giant. We don't have anything to bring. We are afraid. We are paralyzed. We don't know what to do. We have no understanding of what to do. We know if we go down there, we are in absolute trouble. That's who we are. You're not David. You're not expected to be David. Who is David? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 15, 57, but thanks be to God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. What did I just say? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through my faith, my hope, my strength, my abilities, my understanding, God forbid, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. He's already won the victory. Because what happened? Read the rest of the story. When the giant falls down and David cuts off the head of the Philistine giant, what do the Philistines do? They turn and flee. What does the Israeli army do? They begin to flee, to chase them. Why? Why? Because the victory was already won. Listen to me. Your victory is already won. He's already secured your victory. All he wants you to do is what? Follow him in the victory. Yeah, you have to have faith, but you don't have faith. It's not faith in yourself. It's faith in him and what he has already done. So when you go to Psalm 103 and you see those blessings that are listed there, And there are five of those blessings, which I find interesting. Five. Five. Five is the number of grace in the Bible. These are five grace gifts to you to use in your life when the enemy comes. What we're going to do over the next several weeks in the month of June is we're going to take the time talk about each one of these i hope you're going to be here 
Because if you haven't faced these things in your life, you will face these things in your life. And you need to already be what? Rooted and grounded in who Christ is. You need to be rooted and grounded in what he's done for you. Right? I want you to write this down. This is one of my... Shannon's heard me preach and use this before, and it's one of her favorite sayings. It's not original with me. I actually heard it years ago by Dr. Adrian Rogers, but I'll, I'll take credit for it. He's with the Lord. <laughs> he made a statement years ago, and it means more to me now than ever before, and it's this right here. If you're taking notes, write it down. We don't fight for victory. We fight from victory. You see, that changes everything. David is a type of the Lord Jesus Christ. He has defeated your enemy. He's already defeated your enemies. He has already defeated your enemies. He has already defeated every enemy you will ever face in your lifetime. They are already defeated. The enemy comes to what? Lie. Lie. You need to be rooted and grounded in who he is and what he's done for you. Amen. As our musicians prepare for an invitation today, I remember the day like it was yesterday, just a couple of years ago, when the Lord really illuminated that. And, and for me, it changed everything. My battle is just to keep my focus on that. Because when I get bad news, when I get hard times in my life, I begin to think about everything I got to do. Anybody here a manipulator? You know what I mean. Anybody try to manipulate circumstances? How many of you have got to fix everything? The rest of you are lying. We all have a tendency in hard times to try to fix people or try to fix circumstances. And what we do instead of waiting on God and operating in faith that he's already, what, won the battle, we try to get involved, and what do we do? We try to manipulate we're going to manipulate things. We're going to fix things. It's trouble. It's trouble. Do you realize that manipulation is nothing more than a form of witchcraft? You know, you, you tend to think, hey, that's, that's, a, that's not witchcraft. Yeah, what is witchcraft? And by the way, witchcraft is real. Okay? Witchcraft is real. And, and people who use witchcraft are trying to manipulate things around them. Right? Well, let me tell you something. When you and I are trying to what? Fix things rather than trust. Rather than listen and obey. Rather than what? Sometimes be still. And sometimes be silent. We're trying to manipulate. We're trying to control things. And control people. And tr control outcomes. And when we're doing that, guys, we're not doing anything but practicing another form of witchcraft. That's why you got to be sensitive to the Spirit of God. You got to know what He's telling you to do. Because there's going to be times He's going to tell you to speak, and then there's going to be times He's going to tell you to be quiet. He's, there's going to be times He's going to tell you to sit still, and there's going to be times He's going to tell you what? Wait. Sometimes when you got to sell a house, it's easy to get fretty because I got family I got to go see. I got family who's having a baby. I got family that's coming to the East Coast. I got to get my house sold. And the house isn't moving. I'm not seeing any action. But you call the preacher. And the preacher encourages you to pray and to be still. And then I get a phone call from a dear friend who says, Preacher, the house sold. We're headed to the East Coast to be with our family. And not only that, but the family that bought the house is coming from the East Coast to be with their family here. Oh, wow. You mean God can work on both sides? You know, the great thing is there's stories that are multiplied over and over. Can I encourage you to tell your stories to each other? Find somebody, take them to lunch. Find somebody, take them to dinner, and say, can I just tell you what Jesus has done for me? You see, we got to start talking testimony. 
we got to start sharing what God is doing because I'm telling you, God's moving in the lives of people in this congregation. There are some powerful things that are happening among people. Please don't be silent. Herald the good news that what? David has already defeated your Goliath. Because somebody needs to hear that. Because somebody just found out they got cancer. They need to hear your story. Somebody just found out that they're going to have to move. They need to hear your story. Somebody needs to hear because their children are going rogue. They need to hear your story of how God answered that. And you need to be able to tell them, God said, be still. God said, move. God said, speak. God said, be quiet. And, and you've got to, what, pour that into people. I'll just end with this here. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Oh, if we had stories to tell, we'd fill up the whole day, wouldn't we? If you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, I invite you to know him because he has conquered the greatest enemy and that is the enemy of sin that has separated you from God. That battle's done. How do I know that? Because he died and he was buried and on the third day he rose from the dead. The resurrection is the testimony that it's finished and God accepted it. With that death and all of his suffering, so many other blessings came. We'll talk about them. But if you don't know him, you're on your own. You're on your own you're here today you're looking for a church where people love one another they love the Lord they're, they're, they're searching ways to serve one another and to obey him if you feel like the spirit of God is calling you to be a part of this fellowship we invite you to come whatever it is that you need today we're here to assist and to offer blessings upon your obedience as we stand as our prayer partners come we invite you to come today
Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a cross I will ever be true as shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a Change it someday for a crown. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for being here today. Let's show our appreciation to our guests one more time. Be sure to go by and pick up your box. It's uh, got some nice gifts in it, and thank you so much for being here. I know Roy's got a few announcements that he's going to share. I just want to make sure that I remind you to be here Wednesday night with your homemade ice cream. I'll be very disappointed if you don't bring it. All right. Uh, you said, what are you bringing? A spoon? <laughs> I'm doing my part. You do yours. All right. God bless you, Roy. Don't forget to pick up one of these cards that tell about all the events that are coming up there at the welcome desk. Be sure and uh, support all the activities this, this uh, summer. Wonderful to be in the house of God. I have one announcement that is not on any cards, but I need to make. Uh, I, I have to say the ladies' salt ministry, which is our ladies' fellowship group, they can come up with some pretty good announcements. Uh, you remember a few weeks ago, it was laundry and Jesus. You remember that one? And then tacos and Jesus, and I kind of like that one. Well, this this is their announcement this month. Saturday, June the 25th, 8 a, 8.30 a.m. to 11 a.m., <clears throat> salt meeting. Come as you are. Now, here, here, let me get this part in. No makeup, frizzy hair, no worries. Now, I have to see that. I may volunteer for security that day. <laughs> <clears throat> I'm so glad you're here today. Wonderful day. Wonderful time together. God bless you. And all God's people said, Amen. You're dismissed.